He was my thesis advisor and I was his best graduate student until he graduated a second one. Take the word, Ted. Uh, his, his ideas are original and uh, always inspiring. So how do I... I've never used this particular Microsoft Teams. How do I share my screen? You, it's... Uh, I'm looking up, for a share screen. screen. I can I can help you with that, uh, Ted. You need mm -hmm. to press this uh, arrow that is pointing up. There's a square. Yeah. With an and arrow to pointing open up. Share tray. Yeah, okay. exactly. And then it it uh, uh, gives you two options: to share your screen or to share a specific window that uh, oh, needs good. to be already open. Okay. Uh, yeah, now we're seeing the PowerPoint in uh, edition mode. I have to, to I have to grant permission <laughs> to my computer. Let's see, to Microsoft Teams. What permission? Yeah, you, you, would you, I think you don't need because we're already uh, seeing your screen. Okay, but I don't see my screen. Okay, now I do. I don't see anything but my screen. Like I don't see you or um, a list of people's names or faces. Is that a, is that how it's supposed to be? Um, it, it could be. It depends. Uh, if if you do this, uh, I guess you will not see us. There's also a flashing red square around my screen. Do you see that, or is that only something I see? It's it's to, for you, so you know that uh, that's the screen being shared. We don't see it. It's going to give me a seizure, <laughs> an epileptic seizure. It's really, it's really disturbing. Okay, are you sure I can't turn that off? I, I don't think so. No. Okay. Sorry. Well then, fine. So, okay. and I, I also can't see what you're seeing in terms of my face. Am I lined up in the screen so you can see see me? No, uh, we cannot see you. Um, Which hmm. is unfortunate. Hold on. I really do think <laughs> if I you have go back to, to... Yeah, if, if you go back to, to Microsoft Teams, yep. where... Uh, where this arrow is uh, next, it yes. should be a micro microphone and then a camera. Yes. Camera icon. If you, yeah, I if see you it. press the camera icon. It says turn it off as if it's already on. So now it's off. Now it's on. Okay. So I think I think maybe it's a problem with the configuration of the of the. I think it's that I have to allow um, Microsoft Teams to do something with my computer. Hold on a second. Yeah, you're right. Maybe it's a permission of the camera. Right. Give control. Hold on. No, that's not what I want to do. Hold on. I think if I just go to security and privacy and allow. Yes, I can I can guide you, yeah. Um, you have Mac OS, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, oh, oh, I have to click the lock to make changes. I see, I'm sorry. That's why it was grayed out, it wouldn't let me. Now I can click Microsoft Teams is allowed to control my computer. So I think that uh, maybe that would is, help. This, but this is not the permission. The, the permission needs to be the camera. Oh, it's, do you it's know a different how to do permission. that? It, it, there also in security and privacy, but uh, choose on the list on the left, the one that says camera. OK, camera. And then, uh, ah. and then uh, also. 
It will not have access to your camera until it is quit. So I have to quit it and rejoin Microsoft Teams. Yes, but uh, it, you can do it. We, we can wait. OK. All right. Thanks. Bueno, esperamos a que reinicie su programa Microsoft Teams, eh, profesor Ted, para, para que todos podamos también verlo y, bueno, tengamos la oportunidad también de conocerlo, aunque sea de manera, de manera visual, aunque sea de manera virtual. Vale, Entonces esperamos un, un, un par de minutos. Hi, we see you now. Great. Sorry about that. I always use Zoom. I haven't used this before. Yeah. Uh, wait, let me give you permission to be a presenter again. Yeah. Well, in Zoom, there is a green green frame also when you're sharing. But it's uh, less intrusive, I guess. Okay, so now. Yeah. You see my starting Thanks. slide? Great. Okay, I'm sorry for the delay. Well, since I'm the last speaker, no. Ricardo told me I can speak for as long as I want. So uh, yes. I hope you've got <laughs> food and drink by you and stuff like that. Sure. Uh, no, I, I, anyway, okay. So thank you to Ricardo for involving me in this. It would be uh, a lot more fun to be there and meet everybody. Um, and I hope I'll do that at some point. <clears throat> and uh, as far as sorry, talk, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but that is a lie. <laughs> that no. would not come to Mexico City because it's too scared of Mexico City. The only way to enjoy his uh, presence is virtual and is great. <laughs> well, maybe that will change. OK, so. I don't really have a good sense of who the audience is. Ricardo said it's um, graduate students, researchers. This talk will be sort of have many different facets to it, and hopefully at least one or more of them are something that anybody in the audience can latch on to. Um, title is Vacuum Entanglement and the Einstein Equation. The beginning part will be rather historical and just kind of outlining the framework of this whole field. Then I'll tell you a little story about how to think about the Einstein equation completely independently of entanglement and quantum mechanics. Uh, so even if all you got was that part, that could be interesting. And then I'll put the two together and discuss some of my own research on um, how the Einstein equation can be mm, inferred from an assumption about vacuum entanglement. So the whole story begins with black hole entropy. Here's the formula for it. It's the horizon area of the black hole divided by four times the Planck length squared. This is in units where speed of light is one. And the Planck length, as I guess probably everybody knows, is very short, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. So this is counting the area in units of an extremely tiny um, unit. And um, well, how did this idea ever arise? It sounds like kind of a crazy idea. Here's a little timeline of basically how we got to the point of considering such an idea. You know, Einstein finished general relativity in 1915, and right immediately after, Schwarzschild found the exact solution to the uh, field equations in vacuum, assuming spherical symmetry. And, um, well, he didn't understand what he had discovered was a black hole. But that's, in fact, what it is, a spherically symmetric black hole. Einstein didn't expect, by the way, that anybody could find an exact solution like that. The equations are tremendously complicated looking. Uh, so he was surprised, but in fact, uh, there it was. And then um, almost 50 years later, uh, Roy Kerr found another exact solution, this time describing the rotating black hole. Again, nobody had any right to expect that there would be an exact solution. And the, it's important that it was exact, not because we like you know, exact mathematical formulas, but because 
by having an explicit formula for the metric, it was possible to see that there's something very strange happening outside of a rotating black hole, which is that it possessed an ergo region where negative energy particles could have negative energy relative to infinity. This is this is the energy that's the conserved quantity in that space time. And that led Penrose to, in, to conceive of what's called the Penrose process, whereby rotational energy could be extracted from a black hole by essentially throwing negative energy into it. And energy conservation means that therefore positive energy would come out. And that energy is coming from the rotational energy of the black hole. And Penrose also realized that when this happens, the area of the event horizon doesn't decrease. And uh, later that was formally proved by Hawking in the famous area theorem. So the efficiency of extracting rotational energy from the black hole is maximal if it's done in such a way that the area stays the same because the area increase is irreversible. And this is quite analogous to thermodynamics with uh, the role of entropy that the most efficient way to run an engine is in a way that doesn't increase entropy possible. It's a limiting case. So people immediately saw an analog, an analogy between area of a black hole and entropy in a kind of superficial way. Bekenstein shortly after that proposed that actually it be taken totally seriously and that one should attribute this entropy to the black hole that's equal to the area divided by Planck length squared times some co numerical coefficient, which he couldn't pin down precisely. And he did this in order to save the second law of thermodynamics, because otherwise you could throw entropy into a black hole, it would disappear forever for the outside world. And that bothered Bekenstein and bothered Wheeler, who was his advisor. And so Bekenstein proposed this generalized form of the second law, where you count the black hole entropy along with the entropy outside the black hole, and it's the sum of the two that can't decrease. That's called the generalized second law. And then uh, this analogy was further refined mathematically by Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking, who in particular showed that the surface gravity of the black hole, which plays the role of temperature in the analogy, is actually constant on the horizon, even though a rotating black hole is not spherically symmetric. You know, it's bulged out at the equator. Um, but nevertheless, the surface gravity is constant on it. And that's important for interpreting it as a thermal equilibrium state, you know, that would have uniform temperature everywhere. So that was kind of an intriguing thing. But still, Hawking, all of the Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking thought it was purely a mathematical analogy until the next year when Hawking discovered that actually, when you consider the quantum fields in which a black hole spacetime is, uh, or that are propagating on a black hole spacetime, he found that the black hole will actually emit thermal radiation in vacuum. In other words, the vacuum is unstable and it emits radiation from the black hole at a temperature, it's exactly thermal and the temperature is proportional to the surface gravity, which is a purely classical um, geometrical property of the black hole. And the, the temperature is proportional also to Planck's constant. It wouldn't happen if it weren't for quantum mechanics. Um, and the surface gravity divided by two pi. So that's um, suggested that Bekenstein's generalized second law actually was true. In fact, it wouldn't have held without the Hawking radiation. But why should entropy have anything to do with area? It just seems absurd from the viewpoint of anything else that was understood previously about entropy. Uh, entropy area is just a purely geometrical property of the horizon. It doesn't seem to have anything to do with microscopic degrees of freedom or complexions or phase space volume or anything that entropy normally is related to. But uh, Bekenstein, besides the reasons that I mentioned on the previous slide, Bekenstein gave several arguments that tried to tie um, the notion of area to more conventional notions of entropy. So one thing is that it's an extensive state variable. So if you have, say, two black holes, the total horizon area is the sum of the two areas. And um, that's an extensivity property that we would expect for an entropy in a system. It also, even on one black hole horizon, it's not like a global property of the, of the black hole, like the mass would be, let's say. You, 
it's a, it's obtained by integrating a local area density over the horizon. So just like in a in a gas and thermal equilibrium, let's say sitting on the table in a bottle, temperature might actually be different at different heights because of the gravitational redshift. But the total entropy of the gas would be obtained by looking at each little volume and adding up a local entropy because the particles are so small um, compared to the bottle. There's so many in a small volume, you can obtain the entropy by integrating a local density. So you observe that the area is similar. And the, the deepest observation he made is the last one, that the minimal, if you consider how small a change in the area of a black hole could I possibly make? You might think it's arbitrarily small, but taking quantum mechanics into account and the uncertainty relation, Bekenstein uh, observed that actually there is a minimum, and that minimum is the Planck length squared. Well, it's up to a coefficient he didn't know. And that minimum is independent of all the properties of a black hole. It's mass, angular momentum. If it has a charge, it's independent of its charge. So the inter this supports the idea that um, when a black hole transformation is made by changing the area by L Planck squared, that corresponds to one bit of information um, transfer or missing information. If you're adding area, you're, in you're um, increasing the entropy of the black hole by one bit. But still, none of that illuminates the question, well, what are the microscopic degrees of freedom that this area entropy is counting? The uh, suggestion, which I think is essentially got to be the right one, but it's still not completely clear, was made in 1983 by Raphael Sorkin, which is that it actually, the entropy is the entropy of, of quantum fields that are entangled across the horizon. The quantum state is entangled, so restricting to the exterior. The quantum state is a mixed state and therefore has entropy and that that's the entropy that the black hole area is counting was his suggestion. So look, he, I think he suggested it probably for this reason. This is supposed to be a kind of cartoon picture of the Hawking process happening. So in the Hawking effect, uh, this red line represents like photon that escapes from a black hole horizon. This is a space-time diagram. The horizon is the vertical cylinder. The, this is a picture drawn by Roger Penrose. Light cones are tipped inwards, uh, delineating the horizon where the outer edge of the light cone is vertical. And when the Hawking process happens and a particle comes away from the black hole, like that curved red line on the right, there's a partner particle inside the horizon, indicated by the second red dot that falls into the black hole. And that pair of particle and partner is really kind of a cartoon picture of vacuum fluctuations of the quantum field that are in an entangled state. So when the Hawking radiation comes off and reaches infinity, it's in a mixed state because, because of that entanglement that it originated from. So this uh, happens because of gravity, the tidal effect. The inner particle is slightly closer in, so gravity is a little stronger there, so it gets pulled away from the outer particle, which manages to escape. This is really a vacuum instability. So I think that's underlying Sorkin's suggestion that, well, since the Hawking radiation comes from entangled vacuum fluctuations, um, and the entropy that's ultimately carried by the Hawking radiation is the can be traced back to entropy of those entangled vacuum fluctuations. Maybe that's really what black hole entropy is. So let me take a little detour now and explain um, just in flat space time <clears throat> how wide is and how it is that the vacuum is entangled. So it starts with a purely geometrical observation. This is a diagram of Euclidean space contrasted with Minkowski space, just in two dimensions. Euclidean space has translational symmetry and fixing any point, it also has rotational symmetry. And if we write the line element in the usual Cartesian form, you don't see the rotational symmetry manifest, but we can switch to polar coordinates based at this center point. And then the rotation symmetry just corresponds to translating the angle theta. So it's uh, polar coordinates make it manifest. 
Similarly, in Minkowski space, we can write kind of Cartesian so-called Minkowski coordinates that make it obvious that Minkowski space is translation invariant in space and time. But we can also switch to polar coordinates, which are exactly the same as the Euclidean case, except for the minus sign. And then look at what does eta translation, eta playing the role of the angle theta, correspond to. And it's another symmetry on Minkowski space, which is called boost symmetry. It's actually Lorentz transformations that leave this central point fixed. And under the flow of those transformations, this, the Minkowski space sort of rotates into itself, but it's by hyperbolic rotation, such that the region inside this right-hand wedge <clears throat> flows into itself. So a point that starts in that wedge always stays in that wedge. That's called the Rindler wedge. And it gives you a different notion of time translation inside that wedge. I mean, ordinary Minkowski time translation would be just moving straight up this diagram. Whereas boost translation is moving along these hyper hyperbole, which are actually, each one of them is a uniformly accelerated world line. So there's some Hamiltonian that generates the time evolution along this boost flow, and that's called the boost Hamiltonian. And the entanglement of the vacuum finds its expression in terms of that boost Hamiltonian in the following way. So here's again the picture of Minkowski space, draw a space-like line through it, and uh, that a point in the middle divides it, space into two halves. By the way, in, in higher dimensions, we have other planar dimensions perpendicular to this diagram. So we've got a division of space into the right side and the left side. And if we consider the Minkowski vacuum, which I'm writing here as zero, meaning the ground state of any quantum field in there, it could be the quantum fields of the standard model, for example. I mean, that's not just free fields. Um, there's a general amazing result that that ground state can be written in this form I've written here as an entangled, as a sum over energy eigenstates of the boost Hamiltonian here, which also has a counterpart on this side. N would label one of those energy eigenstates. E boost N would be the energy of that state. And the form of the vacuum is an entangled, it's a sum of products of a state N on the right wedge and the CPT conjugate state on the left wedge. And then summing over all the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, or I mean of the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, and weighting by e to the minus pi over h times the boost energy, that's actually the form of the vacuum state. And you see this is an entangled state because it's a sum of products of quantum states. So if you only had access to observables in the right-hand wedge, then you wouldn't see this entanglement. You would effectively see a mixed state. And we can form the mixed state density matrix by taking the projection operator onto the vacuum and tracing over the left-hand wedge. And that will give us this sum of projection operators onto boost energy eigenstates. Because we're forming the projection, we get the square of this coefficient. And this looks exactly like a thermal state exactly the Gibbs uh, canonical ensemble for the boost Hamiltonian at a temperature. You normally expect to see here energy divided by temperature. So the temperature is H bar over two pi. And that's called the unruh temperature of Minkowski space. You know, temperature is, you're used, used to it being an energy, having dimensions of energy, but that's because Hamiltonians normally have dimensions of energy because they generate time translation. This Hamiltonian is generating this boost uh, angle and an angle is dimensionless. So we expect the temperature is dimensionless. Well, in units where H bar is one. Or, well, to put it differently, the boost Hamiltonian is like a rotation generator, so it has dimensions of angular momentum. So the temperature should have dimensions of angular momentum. Oh, by the way, this just made me think of something. Um, questions are welcome. And like I said, since I don't really know the audience, I might be veering off into incomprehensibility or something. So please feel free 
maybe the moderator can figure out how to stop me and ask questions, uh, allow questions. Uh, Ted, yes, uh, I can I can tell you if there's a question and I can interrupt mm -hmm. you. And okay. if I can take the opportunity, uh, what is the is there some uh, coefficient mis missing in the root temperature, the alpha, uh, kappa? So. No. Okay. Yeah. So often the unroot temperature is um, defined relative to one of these hyperboli. So the way Unruh first described it is he said, suppose you're sitting on one of these hyperbole and you're holding a thermometer, then what temperature will you measure? Then you have to multiply this by the acceleration of that particular world line. And that translates this into a temperature associated with the Hamiltonian that generates proper time translation along that world line. Whereas here, I'm characterizing the entire state in the entire wedge without picking one world line. And the Hamiltonian is the is not generating proper time translation, but generating post angle translation. And that's why there's nothing missing. It's just a dimensionless temperature. But we can go from here to Unruh's temperature on a particular world line just by multiplying by the acceleration of that world line. Thanks. Was, did you say there was another question or just that you will stop me if there is one? No, uh, I will I will tell you if there's another question. For now, there is not. Okay, great. Okay, so this is this explains the sense in which the ground state of any relativistic quantum field in Minkowski space is an entangled state. If you across any dividing plane that divides space into two halves. And it has this thermal characterization relative to the boost Hamiltonian. Now, this because of this, there's entropy. If you just restrict to the right hand wedge, the state restricted to that side, which is what I've written here, the trace, the partial trace over the left of the vacuum projector, this being a thermal state has a lot of entropy. And we can write down the von Neumann entropy of that state in the usual way. And that would be minus trace of rho log rho, where rho r is that um, reduced density matrix on the right-hand side. Now, the good news is that this actually comes out to be proportional to area. The bad news is that it's infinite. Uh, just to explain why, if you look back at the picture, remember that a quantum field, a relativistic quantum field, has no... Um, lower limit to wavelengths. If it did, it wouldn't be Lorentz invariant. So you could you can boost any wavelength to make it arbitrarily short. So if the field is a Lorentz invariant field theory, it possesses field degrees of freedom at arbitrarily short distances. And that means that in this sum, there's an infinite number of terms contributing um, arbitrarily closely to this horizon with a small boost energy. Um, and therefore, the total entropy in this thermal state is actually going to be infinite. If you cut it off by just sort of stopping at some shortest wavelength, you would get a finite result, and the result would scale like the area perpendicular to this point, so the area of the interface between the left and the right sides. Uh, but it, since it's dimensionless, it's going to be divided by the short distance cutoff length. So. This is entropy that's actually present in the vacuum outside of a black hole. Whether you like it or not, it's there because if you only observe outside the black hole, the vacuum has this entropy. And this entropy scales like the area, just like the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. So it seems extremely tempting, almost compelling to say this must be related to, maybe it even is, is the black hole entropy, but of course, that can't be strictly true because this is infinite in ordinary quantum field theory. Somehow gravity has to come in and change this answer. And if it has a chance of really being the Bekenstein Hawking entropy, but something has to change it anyway, because otherwise the generalized second law would be meaningless. We always have an infinite entropy outside every black hole. So here's an argument of how it is that gravity actually does make this um, entropy finite. 
So once again, I've drawn that Minkowski space-time picture. Here's the left side and the right side. And these little wiggles are representing quantum field fluctuations and their correlated CPT conjugate partners. So I've just drawn two pairs, A and A tilde and B and B tilde. <clears throat> so if the pair B and B tilde is separated by distance L sub C, then by the time energy, you know, or distance energy uncertainty relation, that if you could really localize them to that distance, there would be an energy uncertainty delta E that goes like Planck's constant divided by their distance. And now considering gravity, the fact that all energy gravitates, this energy is associated with a gravitational field. And um, it has a gravitational, so-called gravitational radius that's equal to Newton's constant G times the energy in units where speed of light is one. So this is the size of a black hole with a mass equal to delta E. And if, where's my cursor? If L sub C, if this distance is smaller than the horizon of a black hole corresponding to that energy, then actually this whole, this pair is actually behind the horizon of a black hole, like a miniature fluctuating black hole. And therefore it's not at all fair to claim that you could separate them distinguish them and assign an entropy to contribution to B. So when is that inequality? That's when L sub C is less than G delta E, but delta E is H bar over LC. So that's H bar G over LC. That's the Planck length squared divided by LC. So we see that if LC is smaller than the Planck length, the pair is swallowed up by a fluctuating you know, quantum black hole. So there are causal structure fluctuations that blurs the distinction between the left and the right, and it cuts off the entanglement entropy at the Planck scale. But this is, I think, a pretty convincing argument that once we have gravity, you know, it plays a role in regularizing that entanglement entropy. Exactly what role it plays is really not clear because, I mean, we'd have to have a theory of quantum gravity to analyze that properly and do it in that context. So this leads to a hypothesis then, um, which has obtained a lot of support, that indeed we should interpret the total generalized entropy, which remember this is Bekenstein's um, entropy outside of a black hole plus the black hole entropy itself. To make sense of that, we have to impose a cutoff epsilon. Otherwise, the entropy outside the black hole would be infinite in, in the field theory. Once we imposed it, we just count the entropy outside down to this um, scale epsilon. And then whatever else is left is the, is the black hole entropy, but we have to use the value of Newton's constant that is scale dependent. This actually refers to the renormalization of Newton's constant with respect to distance, which is actually a well-known thing in quantum field theory that coupling constants were normalized with distance. And the hypothesis is that the sum of these two is independent of the cutoff because it has a physical meaning, which is the generalized entropy, but the separate terms actually depend on the value of the cutoff. For example, if I take the cutoff really big compared to the Planck length, essentially don't include any of this vacuum entanglement entropy, then the first term is zero, and G would be the low energy effective Newton constant, and this would just be the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. Aside from any contribution to S out, that's just due to other entropy outside, I mean, non-vacuum entropy. Like say, if you had a thermal gas outside the black hole, you would certainly include that in the first term. So for this to be true, it, it requires that as epsilon gets um, smaller, and therefore the first term gets bigger and bigger because you're including more and more entanglement entropy in the vacuum, this term has to get smaller, so Newton's constant has to get larger, which tells us that Newton's constant scales grows with um, momentum or, or grows with as the distance gets shorter. And that's a well-known renormalization group flow of Newton's constant. Also, this tells us that the more entanglement there is, you know, 
the more entanglement there is, the bigger the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy should be. That means the smaller Newton's constant should be. So the weakness of gravity is directly related to how strongly entangled the vacuum is. Okay, so that really brings us up to um, an idea that I pursued, which is to sort of turn this whole business around backwards. Um, remember, to get to this point, I had to make this hypothesis, which was not derived from quantum gravity. It was kind of motivated by hand-waving arguments. But maybe this entanglement entropy is really more basic than gravity itself. Maybe the fundamental thing is that any surface in space-time has an entanglement entropy across it in the vacuum. And like other entropies, that obeys thermodynamic and statistical laws. And maybe those thermodynamic and statistical laws by themselves imply the existence of gravity with a value of Newton's constant that comes from the entanglement entropy. So that's the, what I'm going to do now is turn that logic flow backwards, start with an assumption about entanglement entropy and derive gravity. The first step is we have to do this not just with black holes, because if I'm going to derive gravity, I need to derive gravity in this room, not just in a black hole. So, um, but that's okay, because as we just saw, the, the entanglement entropy of um, about a event horizon is is the same essentially as the entanglement entropy in Minkowski space. And the other laws of black hole thermodynamics can also be generalized to Minkowski space. So, um, so really, I guess the moral of that statement is that black hole thermodynamics, while we originally discovered it by thinking about black holes, it's really telling us something about space time everywhere, whether there's a black hole or not. So I've, I've pursued two different roots for this kind of argument. One was way back in 1995 and one was in 2015. I'm just going to describe the latter one, which I think is actually the deeper one. It starts with just something about Einstein's equation. <clears throat> As I mentioned at the beginning, this talk will have a, a part that's just about general relativity and has nothing to do with quantum entanglement or quantum gravity. So, you know, Einstein's equation is a tensor equation. The Einstein tensor is a very complicated thing in terms of the metric and second partial derivatives and first partial derivatives. But um, there's an extremely simple way to describe what the Einstein's equation says about the curvature of space-time. And what it is, is written right here. In vacuum, if you take any small ball, and I'll define in the next slide exactly what I mean by a small ball, but just take a small geodesic ball, and of a given volume, that ball has some surface area. And in flat space-time, there's a specific relation between the volume of a ball and its surface area that everybody knows. Well, in general relativity, the Einstein equation says the same relation between area and volume holds as would have held in flat space. If that statement is true for all small balls in space-time, then the vacuum Einstein equation holds and vice versa. So it's equivalent to the vacuum Einstein equation with no tensors, um, no partial derivatives, no nothing. It's just a simple statement about geometry. When there's matter present, well, then there's an area deficit. So instead of the area being what it would have been in flat space, it's decreased by an amount proportional to the energy inside the ball and the radius of the ball and Newton's constant. So let me show you how this, how to derive this statement from Einstein's equation. First, I have to define what exactly I mean by a small ball. So this is a space-time diagram again. Little o is just some random point in space-time. And this arrow is a, coming out of O, is a time-like direction. And um, perpendicular to that time-like direction is a space-like, three-dimensional space-like slice of space-time. And you can launch space-like geodesics in that perpendicular plane and run them out to a length um, L. 
and that defines some kind of a, a ball, a geodesic ball. And by small, I mean I want the radius of that ball, L, to be much smaller than the radius of curvature of the space-time here. And also small compared to the scale over which the energy, the stress energy tensor is changing. In particular, the energy density is changing. So, you know, like if you had a, an electromagnetic wave passing through the space time here, the ball would have to be very small compared to um, the wavelength of the wave. Later on, I would also need it to be small compared to any length scale and in um, parameters that appear in a quantum field theory, like the Compton wavelength of, oops, of a particle or something like that. So to derive that result, um, we need a basic geometrical fact, which I won't derive, but I'll just tell you that the, um, the area, if we vary away from flat space, the area variation holding the volume fixed is proportional to the Ricci scalar, the spatial Ricci scalar at the center of the ball. Here I'm writing the formula for a space time of any dimension, d. So in uh, four dimensions, d would be four. This would be the three dimensional Ricci scalar of the spatial geodesic slice um, at the point O in the middle of the ball. It would be the Ricci scalar evaluated right there. This is something that was known to Riemann, I think, uh, who invented curvature, um, that the Ricci scalar measures a deficit of area at fixed volume. Uh, the coefficient involves the area of the unit sphere in that two, d minus two dimensions. L to the d is the radius to the d, and then there's this numerical coefficient. And for later purposes, I need to point out something interesting. If I had held the instead of holding the volume fixed, if I had held the radius of the ball fixed, I would get a different answer. It's, it's almost the same, but the, the coefficient differs by a factor of d plus one over three, which is five thirds for four dimensional space time. So that I'll come back to that, that'll be important. So, so far this is pure geometry. Now let's invoke um, uh, the relation to the Einstein Equation. So the Einstein tensor, this Ricci scalar is actually equal to twice the um, zero zero component of the Einstein tensor at the center of the ball. <clears throat> By zero zero component, I mean contract Einstein tensor twice with a unit with this unit vector. So that's just a basic fact that holds because the the space like surface in the ball is um, got zero extrinsic curvature in the middle. Now by the Einstein equation, G00 is proportional to the, t the zero zero component of the stress energy tensor, um, which is the energy density. Uh, proportionality is Newton's constant times eight pi. So if I replace this G00 by Newton's constant times the energy density, multiply by the cube of the radius that's proportional to the volume of the ball, I get the actual energy in the ball. And then there's one over one factor of L that's left over. So this shows that the area variation at fixed volume is um, proportional to minus Newton's constant times the energy inside times L. And that's all classical general relativity. Now I'm going to interpret it in terms of entropy. What is, what's the entropic interpretation of this equation? So I just rewrote the equation at the top. Now the, remember that we're going to assign an entropy to every surface in space-time um, that's given by the Bekenstein-Hawking formula. So I should divide by four h bar g. And then I should divide the right-hand side by 4h bar g. So the g's cancel, and I get an h bar in the denominator. So the question is, is there some reason why the um, entanglement entropy across the boundary of the ball should be related to this quantity on the right-hand side? Is there a fundamental principle that leads to that without assuming the Einstein equation? 
if there is, then we can just run this argument backwards and derive the Einstein equation from that principle. So basically I asked myself, well, what would imply this? What principle would imply this relation? And there's a very simple principle that implies it, which is what are called the maximal vacuum entanglement hypothesis, which is that the vacuum entanglement in any small ball in the vacuum state, it's maximal given the volume. Any other state, if you vary the geometry away from flat space, or if you vary the quantum field state away from the vacuum, <clears throat> you'd get a smaller entropy. This is kind of saying that the vacuum state of the world and geometry plus quantum fields is an, is an equilibrium state in which entropy is maximized within each ball. So I'm gonna now uh, ex explain how under some assumptions, this actually does imply the Einstein equation. Um, okay. So to do that, I need to vary the intent. So if it's true that the entanglement entropy is maximal in the vacuum, then if I make a slight change of the state and geometry, then since it was maximal in the vacuum to first order, it shouldn't change. To higher order, it should actually decrease. So I'm gonna impose now the first order condition that it doesn't change, that it's stationary. <clears throat> so I'm gonna consider the change of the entropy under a change of the metric away from flat space and a change of the quantum state psi. And I'm assuming that the entropy has two contributions. One is a universal area contribution, <clears throat> proportional to the area of the ball. And it's got some coefficient which I'm assuming is a universal entanglement entropy constant of the world. It's like the, it's the entanglement entropy density of the vacuum in the world. Um, later, I'll show how it's related to Newton's constant. This is just the ultraviolet contribution to the entropy, because remember we show that quantum field fluctuations lead to something like that from the short distance contributions. But we also have some infrared or non-ultraviolet contribution. And that just comes from the change of entropy of the matter fields inside the ball. And that comes from a change of um, the quantum state. It's the change of the von Neumann entropy of the quantum state inside the ball. And if we write that quantum state, if we write the state of the vacuum, sorry, um, as e to the minus some k, so in the form of a thermal state, then the usual statistical mechanics arguments tell us that this entropy variation is proportional to the variation of the expectation value of k, as I'll show now, just to review it again. So consider the ground state of any quantum field theory restricted to the diamond. It has some state that could always be written in this form by just, um, you know, k is minus the logarithm up to a normalization constant. There's a name for this k, it's called the modular Hamiltonian. And if we vary the state, that means then the variation of the entropy is the variation of the von Neumann entropy. And if you ever looked at that in quantum statistical mechanics, you know that that just is equal to the variation of the energy divided by the temperature. This is like the first law of thermodynamics that says variation of entropy in equilibrium away from equilibrium is variation of energy divided by temperature. I have no temperature here because I didn't put any temperature up there. So this is just to justify my previous formula that I'm gonna interpret the variation of the IR part of the entropy as variation of the, of the modular Hamiltonian expectation value. Now this would be useless if it weren't for the fact, if we didn't know more about K. And for a conformal field theory, we know everything about K. Um, a conformal field theory is one that's completely scale invariant. So it's a special kind of matter. Real matter is not a conformal field theory, except perhaps in the, ultra, in the deep ultraviolet. Um, 
But I'm going to show you the derivation for the case where it is because it's much more straightforward. And I will briefly indicate that uh, the way I think it can be generalized to any quantum field, not just the conformal one. So for a conformal field theory, this K is actually equal to the conformal boost energy divided by the unroot temperature. And the reason is, let me just briefly tell you why this is. Let me go back to this Rindler wedge. Remember the unruh effect, that if you take the vacuum state in Minkowski space and restrict to this wedge, it's actually a thermal state with respect to the boost Hamiltonian. Well, this Rindler wedge is conformally, can be conformally mapped into the interior of that small ball diamond. You see, inside this ball in Minkowski space, there's a kind of causal diamond, and there's a symmetry that flows the interior to itself which is not a killing, it's not a true symmetry of space-time, but it's a conformal symmetry of space-time. And the vector field that generates it is, I've named uh, zeta here, that's called a conformal boost um, filling field. And this K is equal to the integral, you take the stress energy tensor, contract it with the conformal boost filling field, that gives you the current, conserved current for this um, conformal field theory and then integrate the flux of that through the surface sigma, that gives you the conformal boost energy. And it's a theorem in conformal field theory that uh, K is actually equal to the conformal boost energy divided by the unroot temperature. So we get a direct link between the variation of K, which means the variation of the vacuum entanglement entropy and the variation of the energy. That's the whole point here. Let me just, if you didn't follow anything in the past five minutes, let me just say the bottom line is that the variation of a quantum field entropy away from the vacuum for a conformal field can be directly related to the variation of the energy density in the state. That now, yes. Uh, we have a question from uh, Erika Cecilia. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, I want to know uh, what's the mean of Newman entropy uh, because I didn't understand the the entropy of Newman. Uh-huh. That's it's actually what I've written. Let's see, did I write it earlier? This von you're asking me about this? The von Neumann entropy, is that the question? Yes. Okay, good. So that's by definition minus the trace of rho log rho. It's just, it's the quantum mechanical generalization of the um, Boltzmann definition of entropy. That's the sum of probabilities times the log of probabilities with a minus sign. So it's, it's just the quantum version of Boltzmann's probability entropy formula. Mm, sorry to intervene, but uh, we have been exposed uh, to it by one Maldacena. So that may have created some confusion. Uh, did he explain it in a different way, incompatibly? Yeah, well, of course. <laughs> well, maybe we should come back to this in discussion. And uh, to no, he was trying to explain the information paradox. And, uh... mm -hmm. Well, he was probably talking about the von Neumann entropy in all of the radiation that comes out of an evaporating black hole. Um, whereas I'm talking about the von Neumann entropy inside this ball. So it's still the same kind of entropy, but it's in a different region of space-time. Shall okay, I continue? Thank you. Yeah, I think you should continue. Okay, so the last thing I said before that was just that we have now a way to relate the variation of the entropy inside the ball to the variation of the energy inside the ball. 
And now we'll put those pieces together and derive the Einstein equation from it. So remember that um, the entropy variation had two pieces. One came from the area variation times this fundamental constant I'm assuming exists called eta. And the other was the variation of this modular Hamiltonian expectation value. The first one, remember, is related to the value of the Einstein tensor zero, zero component in the center of the ball. And as I just said in the previous slide, the, the second term, this is related to the integral of the energy density uh, weighted, weighted by this conformal boost killing vector. And when you actually do this integral, what you end up with is what I've written here. Again, assuming the ball is small compared to variations in T, so I can pull T out of the integral, I just get the variation of the energy density right here with some coefficient. And that coefficient looks a lot like this coefficient, even though it came from a completely different place. In fact, this whole part, omega L to the D over D squared minus one is common. And my hypothesis was that if I add this to this, I should get zero. Remember the, the, the vacuum, the maximal vacuum entanglement hypothesis says that if I make a variation away from the vacuum, I should have zero change because it starts out at a maximum. The net change is the sum of this term and this term. So that says that this term plus this term should be zero. And uh, canceling the common factor, that tells me that the zero, zero component of the Einstein tensor is this variation of the zero zero component of the stress energy tensor times two pi over h bar eta. Now that I can, if I apply this to all possible um, orientations, go back to my small ball here. To set up this ball, I had to choose a time-like direction here, but I could have chosen a different one. In fact, there's an infinite number of choices. If if the variation of the entropy is zero, no matter which time-like direction I choose, then instead of just getting a relation between components of the Einstein tensor and stress energy tensor, I get a relation between the tensors themselves. And this is the relation I get. So this looks like the Einstein equation. The Einstein equation would have had here eight pi g times delta t. So this tells me that it is the Einstein equation provided I interpret eta as being equal to one over four h bar g. Or, but it's really the opposite. I'm defining g. Eta was an input in my hypothesis. It's the vacuum entanglement entropy density. So um, this, I've derived that this equation holds, which means that I've derived that the value of Newton's constant is given by eta according to this formula. Now, something beautifully consistent to observe here. It's not just that eta goes like one over h bar g, but the coefficient is precisely one fourth. So the entropy density I started out with actually agrees with the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy density that I would have gotten from this Einstein equation for a black hole. And that's not it's non-trivial consistency because if I had instead of fixing the, um, if instead of varying the area at fixed volume, I had varied it at fixed radius, remember the coefficient would have been like five thirds. I would have had a discrepancy of a factor of five thirds or three fifths in, in four dimensional space time. So this would have uh, disagreed with the Beckett. Yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, Ricardo has a question. Okay. Yeah. Well, sorry, while I have you here, why one fourth? The dimensions, I, I but one fourth? That to goes back to once, so once Hawking discovered that the temperature of the black hole is h bar times the surface gravity over two pi, that determined that the coefficient of the area had to be one fourth of h bar g, just from matching with the classical first law of black hole mechanics. Um, I, I can explain it in detail, but maybe I should do that after the end. 
<laughs> but it's nothing to do with what I'm talking about. It just came immediately when Hawking discovered. The, so I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, uh, I have a curious, pesky mind. <laughs> That's fine. I like peskiness. I okay. inherited it. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Sorry, sorry okay. for the interrupt. But uh, I, I I do believe that uh, it's the kind of question that uh, why one fourth? Right. It comes from comparing with the classical first law of black hole mechanics that relates the mass variation and the area variation, and you then using the Hawking temperature. That's all the inputs you need to get the one fourth. But I can explain in more detail later. Um, OK, so this works, and it implies the Einstein equation from this uh, principle or assumption that the total vacuum entanglement entropy is unchanged to, under a first order variation away from the vacuum state, provided the matter is described by a conformal field theory, as I put in this blue circle. Okay, now I should wrap up really um, with a few other remarks. I think the first one is just what if the field theory is not conformal? Oh, no, no, it was why did I fix the volume? Um, I don't want to drone on for too long, so I think maybe I'll skip this and just say, you know, you could ask me and should ask me, why did you hold the volume fixed? You know, you could have held the radius fixed. And I just show you here, well, it works if I hold the volume fixed. And to be quite honest with you, that's why I hold the volume fixed. I work backwards. I knew my, I wanted to wind up with Einstein's equation. So I asked myself, what, what should I hold fixed if that's going to be where I end up? Um, there are some arguments I think that can be given for why, it, independent arguments for why it makes sense to hold the volume fixed. But I think I better not throw it on and try to explain them now. But they're, um, they're on this slide. Another question you could ask is, OK, all I showed was, all I used about the hypothesis of maximal vacuum entanglement is that the entanglement is unchanged to first order as I vary away from the maximum. But is it really a maximum? Well, I don't know how to really check that, varying the geometry and the quantum state both by finite variations, because then I lose computational control of the problem. I'm not even sure I know how to even define the entropy well beyond there. But I can check what if I um, just vary the geometry at first order and then vary the quantum state to any order, but just on the fixed geometry. And I was able to show in that case that it actually, the entropy does decrease rather than just being you know stationary at first order. And I won't go through the argument now for lack of time, and also, it's kind of complicated, um, but I was able to show for those restricted variations. What about if the quantum field theory is not a conformal field theory? Well, then it's no longer true that the variation of the expectation of the boost Hamiltonian is simply the variation of the energy density times the coefficient. Um, but I hypothesize that it's that plus another quantity that's independent of which time-like direction is normal to the ball. So it's boost invariant. And this was this hypothesis has been checked by some people using hol ADS-CFT holographic arguments. And it seems to be supported, although I'm, I wouldn't bet my life on it yet. But if you assume this, and if instead of comparing with, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a flat space entropy, you compare with a maximally symmetric space, namely one that has a cosmological constant. Um, and if you allow the cosmological constant to sort of vary from ball to ball, when you make that comparison, then the argument can be made to work. And the output is not that you get the Einstein equation in vacuum, but you get it with a cosmological constant, <clears throat> an undetermined cosmological constant. So. Um, I guess all I want to say about this is that it kind of makes sense. 
to consider all maximally symmetric spaces as candidate equilibrium states. Because after all, how do you identify an equilibrium state? Everything is the same everywhere in it, right? But that's what it means to be maximally symmetric geometrically. And flat space time is not the only such space. We also have de Sitter space and anti de Sitter space with any scale. So that's the idea behind this. And I'll skip all the technicalities. And I'll end on this slide uh, just with a, a few remarks. What, what should we make of this argument? So first of all, does the non-conformal story I just sort of briefly sketched really work? What about finite variations and, and also states that are not described by first order variations away from the vacuum? There's a puzzle actually with co coherent states. If you take, let's say you take a magnetic field, um, a very strong magnetic field, it's a very highly excited state compared to the vacuum state, but it's a coherent state and as such, it doesn't actually change the entanglement entropy um, between the inside and the outside of the ball. There's a technical reason for that, why coherent states don't change entanglement entropy in, in non-gravitational quantum field theory. That seems to be a bit problematic for this argument. That's something actually was pointed out to me by Madhavan Bharadarajan. Is how you say his name? Bharadarajan. Anyway, I don't really know the answer to that, so that's a <laughs> worry. Can scalar tensor gravity also fit consistently in the scheme? Is the vacuum entanglement really maximal or is it just stationary? And if it's really maximal, why? Like, what does this really say about quantum gravity? And I think that's the last question I wanna just end on. Okay, is this just a re-deriving of something we knew that doesn't tell us anything about quantum gravity or does it predict something new? Does it give a different way to formulate quantum gravity theory and by different, I mean other than just applying canonical quantization to general relativity. Maybe it predicts that gravity is really statistical, not the fluctu oops, fluctuations in gravity are, are somehow more statistical, not coherent quantum fluctuations. Um, I have no idea myself. I hope that one of the students watching this talk will answer these questions. Thank you. No, thank you. Ricardo, you want to manage the questions? Uh, no, please. Uh, All right. All right. Uh, so let's let's start with uh, Edgar Alejandro. Go ahead. Edgar. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you, Ted. It's great to have you here. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one is very basic. Um, the area deficit uh, you talk about uh, is similar to Reguet calculus in the sense of uh, having something like a deficit, and in that case is about um, triangulations and uh, an angle deficits to characterize the curvature. Uh, is there any association? Is, there, is This is the first one. Hmm. Um, I think it's a very different characterization of curvature than angle deficits. Um, they're both deficits. They must be just alternate ways to characterize curvature, but it seems very different. The angle deficit has to do with holonomy, you know, going around a closed loop, and this has nothing to do with anything about a closed loop. Oh, well, well. Uh, the other one is, is, is more uh, maybe like a philosophical one. Uh, have you seen the work of San Carlo? Um, about uh, extracting the Einstein equations uh, from Hebler space, I, I guess is the title. Um, uh, have you seen it? It's, it's, it's like uh, trying to uh, make a case in, in favor of many words theory uh, about quantum mechanics. Uh, do you have any thoughts about, about it? Um, wait, many, making sense of many worlds theory, but he also had this paper about building space time from entanglement. Yeah, yeah, of Hilbert spaces, but I thought that was a different. Those are two different ideas of his. Are you, is it in the same context? 
I guess it's, it, it's the same, but maybe I understood something bad. Uh, actually, it's, it is based on, on your work. <laughs> well, yeah, let me say, um, let me not address the second one, which is about making sense of many worlds, quantum mechanics, but just the first one. Yeah, he, he was suggesting, he and his collaborators, that um, you know, if you take this to a kind of logical conclusion, maybe the entanglement Instead of saying the entanglement, the reason why the entanglement entropy comes out proportional to the area is because, by definition, area really is entanglement entropy. Like the origin of metric structure in space might be entanglement. And maybe we could even build up space just from abstract Hilbert spaces and their mutual, or which factorize into pieces. So take some big Hilbert space that comes to us as a tensor product of a bunch of factors. And maybe the entanglement between the different factors defines kind of areas that you could associate with their interfaces and kind of build up a geometry with nothing but entanglement being the primary input. I think that was the idea there. Yeah, and, and it's very similar to ER equals EPR, right? Yeah, right. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's a very neat idea. I agree that it's sort of like seems to be the direction this points in. But I, it's very, very difficult to, from what I can see, to turn it into more than just a vague idea because, you know, what is this theory you're starting with that has no space time and no time and no, I mean, how do we, wh what collection of Hilbert spaces with factorization and what quantum state on them should we take such that they end up corresponding to defining a space time? You know, a random collection of Hilbert spaces and a state on them would define entanglements that are incompatible with being embedded in any space-time picture. So I'm not criticizing it so much as saying it's, you know, it seems like it's the beginning of an idea, but I don't know how to develop the next step of it. But I think it's very intriguing. Yeah. Well, can I say something about the first thing you asked? I think I agree with, I disagree with what I said, and I think I agree with what you were suggesting. There's a closer relationship than I was thinking between the angle deficit and the area deficit. Because, of course, mm -hmm. like in a, in a plane, if you have an angle deficit, then you get less circumference than you would have expected for a given radius of a circle uh, if it's a deficit or if it's a. Um, so, probably there is a way to. This is like probably related to a um, solid angle deficit not a single angle deficit. The area <laughs> deficit is like a solid angle deficit. Yeah, because the triangulation are simplexes and mm -hmm. maybe there is an association. Thank you so much again. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Edgar Alejandro. Um, uh, do you want to ask uh, uh, Ricardo? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, going back to Reggie Calculus, um, um, I was given it as a homework uh, when I was your graduate student, Ponzano Reggie. And uh, has become relevant, I think, in uh, soft matter physics. Uh, the the one thing I'm curious is the same question I asked uh, one uh, Maldacena. Area and not extrinsic curvature. Um, that that has we are talking about uh, real objects, uh, right? Black holes, and, uh, they bend. Mm -hmm. And uh, although I do appreciate uh, the mathematical uh, part of uh, general relativity, shouldn't they come in as at least corrections? Yes, and it actually does. Um, did Juan not say so? Because, so, I know of a very specific context in which um, extrinsic curvature corrections do play a role to the entanglement entropy formula. 
there's this um, Ryutaki and Agi formula for um, relating holo entropy in a CFT to the area of a minimal surface in the bulk of the okay. ADS space time that ends on the region in the CFT. But that's a leading order result. And if you have higher curvature, it has to go beyond Einstein's theory. So if you have higher curvature terms in the gravitational action, then that changes the relationship between the horizon and the entanglement entropy and, to, and the correction involves extrinsic curvatures of but the, the, of the, the, mo the, the moment you propose a scalar tensor gravity, mm -hmm. that uh, would come uh, automatically, I think. Uh, no, actually, I think, so for scalar tensor, my inclination would be to make a conformal rescaling of the metric, absorbing the scalar field function multiplying the Ricci scalar and basically work in what's called the Einstein frame, as you know. So I basically okay, turn it into you. an Einstein-like theory. We worked on that. <laughs> right. Then it would be the entropy of, it would be, once again, just the area would be the entropy in the Einstein frame. And mm -hmm. I think that's the right way to handle scalar tensor theory. So I don't think that would be, in itself would bring in extrinsic curvature. It's a kind of it's a kind of a dimension or derivative counting sort of thing that oh, yeah, yeah, why yeah. it is that you only get extrinsic curvature contributions when you have higher curvature um, contributions to the action, or you're looking at lower order um, divergences in the entanglement entropy, or would be divergences. I could point you to references. Also, Aaron Wall showed that the like in love the generalized second law the area increase theorem doesn't work to, as a second law for um, Lovelock gravity. That's a higher derivative correction to yeah. Einstein's general relativity. And I think Aaron Wall showed that perturbatively, if you want to correct it, you should add extrinsic curvature terms to the entropy formula. Thank you, Ted. Thanks, Ricardo. Uh, I don't see any raised hands, so if uh, somebody has a question uh, I, I don't see, please, uh, you can uh, speak now. In the meantime, I can ask uh, one of my questions. So uh, first of all, first of all uh, Ted, I, I love your explanation of uh, why do you use uh, fixed volume? Because it works. Uh, I, I, this is what I tell my students, that sometimes uh, you just need to like do it and, and think afterwards how, how to how to argue that this is the correct way. And of course you were, ex you should expect it to be this way because of this, 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 and, uh, but in reality, you initially you just don't know. And right. uh, second of all, I think it's a, a very interesting way. Like uh, if we try to, uh, to formulate a new, more deep formula of quantum gravity, right? So we have this uh, in this, uh, in this situation, we have uh, some uh, hints, right, of uh, what, what can work and what cannot work. For example, one of them is uh, black hole thermodynamics. And basically, you're turning it around and say, okay, let's assume what, needs, what things we need to assume that will lead us back to the quantum gravity. Uh, to, I'm sorry, to general relativity. So my question, uh, as you said, one of the main points will be if we can uh, learn anything new which uh, apparently I think uh, there's still not uh, a definitive answer there. But maybe another uh, question that m you can clarify for me is uh, the physical picture of what you are proposing now. Uh, like instead of proposing Einstein uh, questions, you know, just the equation and then we see that the consequences are correct, let's say. What you, you propose now is a black hole thermodynamics and this principle of maximal entanglement. So maybe yeah, and this lead to general relativity. So maybe you can explain the, the, the physical frame uh, for me, I'm sorry, I, I didn't get it, of this uh, maximum entanglement entropy uh, principle. Right, I, I can't say I, I, almost anything really cogent about it, except that I, maximal entanglement seems to be a kind of equilibrium property to me, like because if complicated systems have settled down they're interacting with each other. You know, like for example, you know about the um, 
what's it called, the uh, eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, in, or, or in maybe just eigenstate thermalization, because it's proved to some degree in quantum mechanics. You take a complicated quantum system, put it in an energy eigenstate, a random state, but just then carve out a subsystem of it and ask what is the reduced density matrix look on that. If the system is a complicated enough system, it will be almost exactly describable by a thermal state in the subsystem. And that's one way of accounting in statistical quantum statistical mechanics in a way for why is it, why are systems in e subsystems in equilibrium well described by the canonical ensemble. So I guess I'm saying, and the canonical ensemble maximizes entropy at fixed energy. So somehow entropy maximization seems to be just a natural outcome of complicated things interacting with each other. Entanglement entropy maximization, because just because everything has had a chance to get entangled with everything else. Um, so if I think of a big universe, um, having in its old age, you know, it's, it's had plenty of time to settle down. Whatever the microscopic fundamental description is, it's settled down into its um, state that is maximally entangled. One region is always maximally entangled with the adjacent region. If it weren't, it's like information would flow. Something would still be happening. Um, so this is completely hand-waving, but it's the way I think about why would it be natural that the vacuum would be would have this maximal entanglement property? I mean, of course, ultimately, this would really only be satisfying if we could derive it from some fundamental underlying theory. So I'm not aiming that high at this point. So in, in a sense, uh, we can see it as, as some kind of zero law, uh, where you say like, if, if, if it weren't, there will be some transfer instead of uh, heat, transfer of temperature will be a transfer of entangle of information to get the entanglement. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay, so yeah, uh, very interesting idea. Ah, sorry. So uh, I don't see any more questions. So I think uh, this is the moment then to, to end by thanking our speaker. Uh, so if you can, please uh, turn on your cameras and microphones so that we can thank uh, Ted. <laughs> Thanks again, Ted, for, for your talk. Eh, so, con esto terminamos este, la escuela de verano, ¿verdad? si no me equivoco. Este, aprovechando que Alberto Sánchez está aquí, eh, ¿quieres eh, clausurar el evento, Alberto? Bueno, pues agradezco a todos los participantes, tanto los eh, expositores como a los asistentes, a los estudiantes que aún se mantienen aquí después de una larga jornada a lo largo de toda la semana y, y del día especialmente. Sabíamos que eh, estas sesiones de cuatro horas podrían ser un poco eh, este, pesadas para a muchos, pero este, confiábamos en que podríamos eh, eh, lograr eh, tener una a, asistencia considerable de, de los, todos los estudiantes que están eh, interesados en este tipo de actividades que realizamos en el Departamento de Física. Como saben, en esta, eh, en, en esta ocasión, eh, la eh, realización de esta escuela de verano coincidió con el 60 aniversario de, del departamento. ¿no? Esta es la 52 ava edición de, de, de esta escuela. Y eh, pues es, nos es muy grato que eh, hayamos eh, podido llevar a cabo eh, esta, la realización de, de este evento aún en estas circunstancias. Y pues eh, deseo que haya sido eh, para todos los asistentes principalmente, que está dirigida a los estudiantes, a los estudiantes de, de provecho. Entonces, eh, sin más que agregar, eh, pues... Eh, Da, doy por finalizado uh, oficialmente el evento y la, la realización de esta jornada de actividades con motivo del 60 aniversario del Departamento de Física de Simistar. Gracias a todos.
Ricardo. 